Okay, welcome everybody to our latest uh, Microcap Fund Manager interview series. I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Luke Winchester from Merweather Capital. Luke, how are you? I'm good, Mark. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's great to have you on and congratulations on getting the uh, fund up and running. It's good to have another uh, institutional microcap fund in, in the mix. And maybe we'll start there. Why don't you give us, I guess, a quick overview of Merwether Capital, the fund, and I guess the kind of stocks that people should expect to kind of see inside in, a, in this portfolio? Yeah, no, thanks. So Merriweather Capital, like you said, it'll be true micro cap. It'll be, it'll be true to the label. I think there's a few who put micro cap on the name of the fund. And if you look at the holdings, we'd sort of differ a little bit as to whether they're micro caps or not. But um, yeah, Merriweather Capital will be well and truly fishing in that sort of 20 mil to 200 mil market cap. So, so my definition of market cap is very much aligned with yours. Um, yeah, no, look, I, I think you're right. There's very few um, funds that sort of stick true to that. And it's a good point of difference. For, for funds that do. And I think you've seen the ones that do can, can generate significant outperformance over time. And that's just a nature of, of playing in micro caps where um, the opportunities, I think, are you know, much more um, abundant for investors that are willing to, to put in the work where there's no broker research, there's not much chatter on, on forums or um, in particular companies themselves may be bad at, at sort of putting together a clear investment case in investor presentations and things like that. So you know, looking to play in that space. Um, I've been investing in microcaps personally for over a decade. So I'm, I'm stoked where the capital is just sort of an extension of what I've been doing for a very long time. And um, yeah, um, as, a, as for a taste of what people can expect from the fund, um, we'll talk about a couple today, but, but for you know me, it's always um, good businesses that are just small growing, um, preferably have founders or, or highly incentivized management teams leading them. Um, you know, very little debt, uh, very little speculation in their business models. Um, they're just good businesses that happen to be small um, and, and hoping to hold them for a long time and, and grow with them, basically. Great. Thanks for the overview. And yeah, let's maybe like jump into the first one straight away. Uh, so the first one you've got up today is uh, Eight Common. So for people who mightn't be familiar with the story, Give us an, an overview of basically how Eight Common make their money. Sure. So uh, Eight Common's a, a micro cap uh, fintech. It's uh, about thirty five mil market cap. I think last time I had a look. Um, so Eight Common, their core product is an expense management and, and travel um, SaaS solution, um, primarily aimed at government, but um, they have a few corporates as well that are, are customers. Um, Woolworths, Amcor are two of the larger ones they call out. Um, the business sort of muddled around, I must admit, if you rewind maybe four or five years ago, um, new management came in and really refocused the business onto the opportunity within government. Um, and and to, to fair credit to them, they've done a, a really exceptional job of, of that penetration into government and in particular federal government where... Um, of course, government's very sticky clients. They have a much higher ARPU than, than the corporates because they fully utilize um, the travel modules and um, actually pay ad additional for um, extra security and things like that required with government transactions. So, um, you know, how, how they make their money, it's, it's through the provision of, of the software. Um, there's also some um, uh, usage-based revenue as well. So, so the amount of sort of expenses and trips that are booked through the system. So, had a hit through COVID because of that, just less corporate business travel being booked through the, um, the expense eight solution. Um, but they're starting to come through that and, and through the COVID pandemic, the metric I've really focused on is the, is the user growth on that platform, which grew, I think at about 32%. Um, and to me, that's the underlying growth of the platform. So to sort of strip out the effects of COVID, I think the business can sort of catch up to that user growth, even though the reported revenue growth was about flat. So yeah, that's a quick intro to the, the, the product and the business and, and effectively how they make their money. Okay, so if we move on maybe to the, the investment thesis, is, is that the kind of continuing thesis you've alluded to there in, in the description? It's just, you know, getting more government departments, uh, either at a federal level or, you know, moving down into the state levels, or is it, you know, trying to maybe push back out into corporate uh, while at the same time growing the government side maybe just give us your kind of the two minute thesis on why you like it 
Yeah, no, you, you've summed it up quite well. So, you know, how, how I like to think about stocks is always sort of downside protection first and then and then let the potential upside um, come afterwards if the business can, can execute, um, you know, sometimes better than what you expected. So for Rate right Common, they, they won a, a pretty transformational federal government agreement um, uh, late last year, uh, sorry, back in July. Um, and... That agreement is for the whole of federal government. So they currently have about 20 odd federal government departments that are already using expense eight. This is to roll it out to another 70 for the full suite. And then there's some additional departments which are opt-ins. So they're not, not federal government, but they work closely with the government. And so it makes sense for them to have similar backend software so they can, can sort of um, you know, uh, easily work with government departments. So that's a, that's a big agreement for 8Common to win. And, and if you run the rough numbers around the additional users it will bring to the platform and, and the ARPU of federal government users, it adds anywhere between maybe six to seven mil annualized recurring revenue over you know, the, the period of, 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 of implementation, which um, is likely to start mid next year and could run for you know, two or three years after that. So I think for a lot of investors, Patience becomes probably the main investment thesis with Eight Common. You know that that contract, it's it's a government contract, very sticky. It's not going anywhere. Um, I, I guess you could apply some sort of risk parameters to a change of government, maybe stripping that away. But for me, I, I view that revenue as quite certain and locked in. Um, it's just about, of course, the time it takes to implement that and, and onboard it onto the Expense Eight platform. So for me, that provides my sort of base case investment scenario over the next few years. I think this is a business that goes from about three mil ARR today to, you know, around ten in in three or three or four years time, just from what they've sort of won already. And then, of course, if the business can execute better than that with some other modules and some other things they're doing, or into corporates, as you alluded to, um, that's just where businesses can can execute better than what you expect and. and and, and you can see some great returns. But I always sort of try to focus on, um, I guess, my base case. My base case returns a, a good um, sort of IRR on, on, you know, on an investment, then, then that's always what I'm looking for. And, and yeah, maybe if we, you know, flip to the other side then, uh, you know, risk to the, to the business that you alluded to, you know, we could ever get change in uh, federal government. You know, poor execution could be one where, you know, a lot of these projects, especially, you know, with security clearances and stuff, I can imagine dealing with federal government, you know, it, it, it can take longer even even than, you know, what they initially expect, even even with them already kind of servicing a few departments and having a lot of the initial work uh, done. But uh, yeah, maybe sketch out maybe one or two of the, the risks. And yeah, maybe if we just focus a little bit on losing the contract, how long was the initial contract for? And, you know, when does it come up for renewal? Yep, yep. Um, so from memory, I think it was a, a seven-year contract. So it will come up for renewal. And obviously, you know, it is one they, they could use. Um, so that was through a tender process. And, and their main competitor in the space is SAP Concur, which, you know, SAP, giant um, German behemoth. So so eight common competing with them. Um, it is It is important that they... Um, maintain the edge that they have, um, particularly in the Australian government. I think focusing the product on the government is what helped them sort of win that contract while S&P may have had their eye on the ball in, in some other regions. Um, you sort of nailed the key risk though, and that is, you know, we know from, from you know, even our experiences as, as taxpayers, we know how slow and um, bureaucratic and, and in a change of government in particular, the, these big projects can, can really get derailed. So, that is a risk, and, and and to be fair, that's a risk that's probably played out for Eight Common in the past because they've won similar Fed government schemes in the past, um, which you know were slower than what everyone expected, and then in the end were superseded by another program or another scheme until we are where we are today. Um, the reading I've done around it, I'm I'm pretty confident that the federal government has has gone so far down this path already. I think they're committed to to the project they're trying to roll out, which is essentially just having a consistent tech platform as a government backend. So one consistent ERP, one consistent um, expense management, one consistent, um, you know, um, HR software. I think, I think they're committed to that. Um, right now, that's eight common. There's a risk they could lose that. Um, but like I said, it's for me, I, I've sort of... Um, fact in that risk as much as possible but but i i view that revenue as, as pretty certain over the next few years and, and i think the company does too um you know when that comes up for renewal of course they'll be in the box seat to win it again but you are right that is a 
it is always a risk for these businesses where you're, you're constantly, um, you know, tendering, particularly for governments who, who, who do put their, um, their, uh, their works up for tender. So interesting yeah. to, uh, to consider. That's a, a bit of a while off and maybe they'll have to diversify the, the corporate side of the business a bit more so they won't have such a, such a key customers by the time that rolls around, but that's a, yeah, a long yeah. way to go and before then. That's right. And speaking to the, to the management team, um, the early, um, I guess, inbound signs of demand they've seen from corporates has been strong. So by winning the government as a big sort of validation of the product and sort of put them on the map to, oh, this, this is a, you know, like I said before, a very small ASX micro cap um, where, where SAP concur is, is the, is the uh, behemoth in the space. So puts them on the map and they've said the inbound sort of um, inquiries from, especially from corporates who have sort of said, okay, these guys have, um, you know, obviously must have a very solid product and, and have all the uh, security standards and what's required of government work. So naturally, um, you know, for corporates looking at an IT overhaul and maybe their expense software is part of that, 8Common may now be a part of their conversation. So uh, you're right. Um, can they execute on that over the next few years? I certainly hope so. But like I said before, I'm always coming back to my base case, which is sort of the, the revenue I think I can model out, particularly from that federal government contract. Mm-hmm. So key announcements uh, we should be looking for from Acommon in the, in the next kind of 6 to 12 months. Is it literally just, okay, we've got... 70 odd government departments and you just want to see okay where they've added you know three four five six whatever kind of every reporting period the kind of number is climbing pretty, pretty much yeah yeah so um they had a good announcement um, a couple of weeks ago where the government had chipped in about five hundred thousand dollars to uh, assist with the uh, upgrade to the expense eight product um around security and essentially um, make it more scalable to, to have a quicker rollout. Um, so that, that was a good sort of vote of confidence from the government. But, but you're right. For me, um, management's already said they want to start onboarding clients sort of mid-2022. So you're looking for announcements in the lead up to that, that they, you know, you're starting to see that interest pick up. And then, and then as soon as possible, yeah, when quarterlies roll around, there might be another three or four departments that have been rolled out in a quarter or... Um, you know, hopefully even more than that. So, so for me, that's what I'm looking for. Um, I haven't touched on that. They do have another module called Card Hero, which is um, uh, using an EML powered card. I'm sure people will be familiar with EML. Um, that's sort of a, a, a nascent vertical for them. So, you know, I, Card Hero, I think, could be big for the, the business if they can execute right over the next few years. So a Card Hero announcement would be, would be big for the stock price. Um, but again, I'm sort of putting that a little bit um, as, as, as the cream on top um, if they can really um, get that side of the business humming. Um, so, yeah, that'd be the key announcements I'd be looking for over the next few quarters. Okay, great. And if we jump on to the second one, actually... Uh, companies presented uh, our morning meetings, I think maybe two or three mm. times now, is um, XREF. Maybe for people who mightn't have caught those or are not familiar with the business, uh, the name doesn't really give away what they do. Uh, so maybe just, yeah, how do the XREF guys make their money? Yeah, well, encourage people to go and, and, and watch the presentations. Um, Lee Martin Seymour, the CEO, presents really well and, and um, you know, really explains the business well. So it's a reference checking software is the simplest way to describe it. Um, so it creates a platform where if I'm an employer and I've got a new um, a new role, I've got applicants apply for that role. If I'm using XREF, I, um, you know, maybe I've, I'm, I'm down to one or two applicants. I'm doing my reference checking phase. I onboard them onto my XREF platform and um, they're able to log in and provide the details of their referees. So emails, phone numbers, uh, you know, that goes then out to the referees who are able to, at their own leisure, log on, provide those written um, references and, you know, any other um, stuff they may wish to provide. But it basically just stops the, you know, the HR, I don't know how many people have worked in HR, but it's just annoying phone calls of you've got to catch people at the right time and, and people are busy. It, it just allows everyone to work at their own pace um, and, and the system sort of provides prompts and, and, and collates everything in the one spot. So very simple software is, is how I've always sort of um, had it in my mind, but, but simple works. And, they, and they've really done well to dominate this niche. And if you open up their presentations, um, the, the, the logos on the presentation of their customers, they're, they're, uh, they're blue, bluest of the blue chips, um, and they consistently win more quarter on quarter. So 
you know, it's a, it's a simple product, but they obviously do it really, really well. Um, integrates with all major HR software. Um, you can do it standalone as well, all cloud-based. Um, and the business, uh, you know, has really exploded out of COVID um, on the back of this great resignation, great, you know, people have sort of termed a few words of, of people, COVID's hit, you sort of reassess your life and your working, your working life in particular. Um, and, and, you know, you only have to open the paper to hear stories about labour shortages and issues like that. So XRF right in the middle of that um, and, and, you know, getting some really fantastic growth um, in the product and, and all organically too. Yeah, so I, is that the kind of core, the investment thesis? It's the, I guess, this great resignation thing that we're all reading about, plus the kind of reopening of economies more fully after COVID and just, you know, what COVID has done to disrupt labour markets um, globally with, you know, immigration, let's say, to Australia, you know, well down. So now people are, you know, really struggling to hire people and having to look much more domestically in Australia. I think that's kind of true globally. Um, is that the core kind of thesis on this one? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of trends supporting the business. I mean, I, I don't invest just because of the trends, but it's obviously nice to have, you know, a business that, that has tailwinds rather than headwinds. So all of those things for sure. I mean, you know, it's great resignation, the move to remote work where, um, you know, you may not even be able to interview someone in person if, if it's for a remote job. And so you, you, you probably rely on, on, on um, you know, credible referees more than what you normally would. So a lot of factors sort of built into it. But, but for me, it, it just comes back to this business is really experiencing some explosion growth so it's about a hundred percent year on year um, admittedly COVID affected FY21 but but that was about flat on FY20 so even on a two-year basis it's, it's about a hundred percent but more importantly for me like I said before I don't do a great deal of speculation in, in my investments or, or, or the businesses I, I want to own so you know what really put XREF on my radar was the, the business has swung well and truly into operational cash flow positive which is not something you see every day from from ASX micro cap technology business um, and I think it goes to show um, a few things about the XREF business model, which are probably a bit different to your traditional technology businesses. So the main one that, that I'm referring to there is their main source of revenue is they actually sell credits to be used on the platform. So some of their heavy users are transitioning to a traditional SaaS model, which we're all familiar with. You subscribe to a product and, and you're at, you have free use of it. But by far, most of their customers engage on a, on a usage basis. So I purchase uh, 100 XREF credits up front. I then, you know, every time I onboard an applicant into my X, uh, XREF platform, that uses one credit. So you can sort of see the working capital cycle of this business um, means that um, they don't really have to invest a great ton of cash to, to grow very quickly and then you know, have a, an ongoing subscription revenue that sort of comes in over time, which is how most SaaS businesses have to sort of invest ahead of that curve. Um, so this is a business that's growing extremely fast, but also bringing in a ton of cash at the same time, because even as they win a new customer, that customer might be buying 100, 200 credits and cash is coming in the door straight away. So a very nice working capital cycle is, is something that I love. You, you constantly see cash sales ahead of the reported revenue. So they report revenue when, it, when a credit's used. Um, and then the other one as well, I was quite impressed when I when I spoke with um, when I spoke with Lee. Um, they did a very good job during COVID about really assessing how they went to market with the product. So prior to COVID, they had your traditional sales BDM outbound sort of marketing, which was working, but. COVID meant they pivoted to what they called a product-led marketing, which means really focusing on strong reviews on software um, software review websites. So if you had someone you know, searching for reference checking software, their software is the highest rated. It's, it's a very strong lead to try and win. So you know, you're obviously paying to get those leads from these software review websites, but you're encouraging your customers to go and review you, get that rating really up there, and it obviously drives that flywheel. And then the other one was... Um, they had a lot of employee costs in onboarding new customers. So they created what they called XREF Lite, which was basically just a web-based version of XREF. And you're able to just log on and, and set it up for free, which anyone can. You don't have to be a business. You can just go and create an account, set up an XREF Lite account, and you can have you know a, a couple of um, credits into your account. In I think it, I, I did it myself. It took about a half hour to just set up an account. So really reduced the friction of that onboarding. And, and so what it meant was essentially that... Um, 
um, employee costs and marketing costs really fell. Um, you know, I think 25, 30 odd percent from FY20 to FY21. But at the same time, revenues exploded and sales exploded. So the, the jaws of that leverage really opened up. And this is a business that did um, two and a half mil operating cash in the fourth quarter last year. And then the seasonally weak quarter of, of first quarter this year still did another sort of 1.5, 1.6. So well and truly into cash flow positivity, and but more importantly, growing very strongly with that. And then I guess risks for, for XREF, um, is it, you know, not being able to manage this like high growth or, you know, we drift back into lockdowns. We see, you know, Austria, you know, starting a mandatory 10 day lockdown um, from today. Although mm. by the virtue of the protests we saw in Vienna, I don't know how that is actually going to play out. But you know, is it is that a kind of a a, a kind of a, a let's say I I won't say left field risk, but you know, if we start seeing lockdowns re implemented across these major economies, because XREFs, I, th I think we also should mention is a global business now. It's just not an Australian yes. business; it's a truly global business. Um, yeah, maybe just sketch out some of the risks we might you know encounter over the next twelve months for the business. Yeah, look, any anything like that that puts a break on essentially, you know, new jobs being created or people moving jobs um, is a risk to XREF. So, you know, if you have a lockdown, everyone obviously hunkers down and government support kicks in very quickly. There's um, there's going to be much less of that sort of uh, movement between between um, jobs. Um, that that's a that's a bit of a left field risk. I agree with the way you phrase that. Um, for me, the biggest risk I see to XREF is um, the Addressable market, like I said before, they operate in a nice little niche. Um, I think that niche, they can grow quite strongly within that, even from where they are today. Um, they're somewhere around that maybe 12 to 14 mil revenue. It sort of depends on how quickly they can grow in the next few quarters. Um, you know, that, that can still substantially grow, um, you know, many multiples from here. But I don't think this, in their core reference checking business, is a, you know, two or $3 billion run rate revenue business. So the biggest risk is from a long-term point of view, like can this business sort of pivot into new verticals? And they're trying to, they're, they're you know, working on a um, sort of an employee um, exit survey product, um, another product they've called like a pulse check, like an employee satisfaction sort of module. So you're moving more into traditional HR software with that. And there's probably, you know, some, some, well entrenched and funded competitors. So that, that's, that's probably a longer term risk, shorter term, the biggest risk I see is that they fall back into the sins of the past, which is maybe throwing a lot of cash at some unprofitable growth or, or whatever. But, you know, that was probably my hesitation when I first came to the XREF story, maybe six, nine months ago. Um, every indication I've seen since then, I think COVID was a, um, you know, a real inflection point for this business. And I think they've realised or Lee's realised that, um, you know, running a business at a loss, the market's not always going to be there to provide capital if if and when you need it. So having a sustainable business moving forward, I think is a very good thing. And so I think they'll maintain that moving forward. Um, so yeah, a few a few risks, but but to be honest, um, you know, you, you sort of mentioned this before um, off call, but growth sort of covers over a lot of those issues. And this is a business that has growth in spades. And I think, um, you know, I, I think a lot of those risks will sort themselves out if, if the business can maintain the level of growth, which I think they can. Okay, great. And then, yeah, announcements from XREF over the next six to 12 months. Uh, are you just kind of focused on that, you know, kind of twin metric of, okay, what's the growth level at the, t uh, at the top line? And then, okay, how much of that is getting converted into, into cash then, uh, you know, a bit further down the statement? Yeah, yeah. So um, this is a business, like I said, they've got a lot of blue chip customers, but they don't really announce them separately. So you'll usually see in the quarterly report, they'll just have a paragraph as to the new customers they've onboarded in the quarter. Um, so I wouldn't expect anything like that. Um, out of the blue, there may be announcements around channel partners or, you know, um, you know, integrations with other HR softwares, which may drive some, um, some, some sales to them. But for me, the, the main announcements here yeah, will just be the, the quarterly reports. They still report quarterly, um, although, you know, that they will be coming up to, I think it's four quarters in a row of, of operating cash flow positive. So uh, wait and see, but hopefully they keep reporting quarterly. I think that's always a, a nice thing for companies to do. And, and you're right. The main thing I'll be looking for is just, um, you know, I, I don't think they can maintain 100% growth rates forever, but, but you know, that, that sort of trajectory, 
Um, bearing in mind there is seasonality to the business, um, you know, in particular um, the the northern hemisphere now, which is, is nearly the majority or more, it is the majority of the business. Um, you know, their summer and our winter is their two biggest um, periods. So so first quarter and fourth quarter um, are usually a bit, little bit slower. So. Um, yeah, and then the other one, like sort of touched on before, for me is is just seeing that operating leverage continue to play through the business because I think this is inherently a very, um, you know, high leverage business in the sense of incremental margin should be should be really strong. Um, so, fingers crossed they continue to play out. So far, they they have and, and, and better than I expected to be honest. Uh, the last couple of reports, uh, the fourth quarter twenty one blew my socks off. Um, first quarter just recently, I thought was was better than I expected and, and, and very solid. And so hopefully that can continue. Oh, great. And then finally, if people want to find out more about the new fund, what, what's the best way to get in touch with you or find out about the fund? Yeah, so I've got the website, uh, merryweathercapital.com.au. Um, I think hopefully we've um, now got that up and, and launched. It should be up there today. Um, feel free to email me, luke at merryweathercapital.com.au. I'm on Twitter, uh, at Luke Winchester 9 um, You know, if you can't reach me at any of those three places, <laughs> I'm always on, on Twitter and email. So uh, more than happy to take any questions. Yeah, Luke is uh, definitely definitely catch him on Twitter. He's uh, <laughs> a vibrant member of the uh, Australian fin twist microcap yes. uh, niche. Anyway, um, try to bring a bit Luke, of humour too. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have some other good contenders for that as well. <laughs> um, Luke, thank you very much for that, and yeah, good luck with the new fund. I'm excited to see how it goes. And we will hopefully have you back on again, uh, maybe a couple of months down the line once uh, we've got uh, some, I guess, reports under the belt in terms of monthly fact sheets and stuff. And uh, we'll maybe uh, check in and how we're going then. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks, mate. Really appreciate it.